Hello, I'm Dr. Sam Hancock of the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. We come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. in the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, the technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And as we have a planet of 9 billion people by 2038 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of this century, how are we going to be able to take care of all these people on planet Earth? And that's what Emerald Planet's all about. We come to you looking at the solutions, the best practices from around the globe as we create the Emerald Planet. Hello, welcome to the Emerald Planet. We're making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And see the long-term impacts of climate change. But we're glad to have you. Thank you for being with us. Looking around the globe, how do we take care of Mother Earth to accentuate and make even renewed not only the water, which we talk about often on the Emerald Planet TV, but also the soil and the air? And we have someone who really is focused on the soil, but actually to counterbalance and to renew the air and water at the same time. This is really, truly a world phenomenon and expert, Dr. Andrew Harley. He is the president, researcher, and author for the Ascension Soil Company. And we're gonna be talking about rejuvenation of land, water, and air quality using biochar. And Andrew, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Uh, great, uh, thank you, thank you very much. I uh, look forward to the conversation. Well, we're glad to have you here. Uh, Ascension Soil Company, why the term Ascension in your name? Yeah, yeah, yeah. look, look, uh, Sam, it, it's, um, uh, it came about actually about almost uh, over 25 years ago now. Um, and when I was beginning, you know, I was finished my academic work. I was kind of, you know, you know, you know, looking at where I wanted to take it, and the concept of ascension of bringing, bring, bringing things to life. Um, and this was really, you know, I was looking, I was working on very, you know, dead soils, and it came to me there's the whole concept of bringing soils to life, because the the the, the soils like the, the a healthy soil is a live soil, uh, and it was it was it was really just kind of um, you know just an inspiration. Uh, mm -hmm. Almost 25 years ago, that that was really my, you know, you know, you know, my mission uh, was to to improve not just you know improve soil quality, but but through bringing it to life, not just the the mineral components, you know, the nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, the things that we think about as nutrients, but the importance of the microbial uh, action in that, you know, the living pieces of this um, that 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 really can sustain uh, life on this planet. I think that's very important, and I really uh, admire the logo that you have it's beautiful but yet it really tells a story in itself but looking at rejuvenation why the term rejuvenation and why are we looking at this balance between land water and air uh, for the improvement of the environment the concept well not, not it's, it's not really concept i mean i mean i mean human life is basically dependent on six to 12 inches of, of, of veneer around the, you know, you know, around the planet, you know, you know, obviously water resources are important. Obviously the, 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 the air we breathe is, you know, is, is important, but that thin veneer, the, you know, you know, that's, that's, that soil, the, 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 the difference between, you know, you know, you know, geological processes, you know, you know, in, in, in our rocks and, 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 um, you know, you know, the air processes is, is this, this, this biological process that occurs within the, within the soil and so much happens within this particular very very thin thin layer i mean as a as 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 a proportion of our land surface it's 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 minuscule but with with, with without it and it does there are so many things that happen within this soil uh this soil process um and you know we can we we can deal with 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 a range of 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 our challenges um a, you know a range of our challenges are are, are, are associated with with uh, um, uh, issues around our soil, and by correcting those soil things, there are so many benefits that we can have, and it's 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 really this 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 cumulative effect. It's not just a one-on-one -on -one 
one component by dealing with with this very thin veneer of the soil we can we can manage so many different other aspects of, and 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 challenges so that's why I'm, I'm you know fascinated about the power that 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 the soil can help us uh in in in, in mitigating um challenges um you know whether they be you know climate change challenges uh water quality challenges food production challenges uh it is all dependent on the on on the soil and our current kind of engineering approach to managing the soils not necessarily working you know you know you know we we, we we're, we're losing so much um uh you know so many soil you know you know so much soil but not not just in terms of volume but in terms of of, of productivity as well okay i understand that and also we talked about the renewable energy waste management all these other issues but really soil you think is one of the key now looking at the the biochar i put this up uh this image uh side by side so we can actually uh, look at all of that but let's go through this uh, uh uh as far as what is actually happening here uh in the biochar as far as the canopy is concerned and then everything we really don't see below yeah yeah look look so so just taking a step back from you know you know you know, you know biochar is a a form of carbon and you know you know we we in terms of dealing with climate strategies you know you know you know when we, you know, we we talk about carbon sequestration we talk about having having you know you know you know too much carbon in the in 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 the air biochar is just another form of carbon carbon is this 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 whole um uh, uh sequence of 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 forms um, and uh, we, you know, you know, we're constantly talking about about carbon sequestration. Oh, we need to get carbon out of the air. We need to put carbon, you know, in the soil. We need to pump it deep into the, uh, uh, um, in, you know, into the earth. The real value of carbon is that it does cycle. It is, it is, it is a cycle. It's like water. You know, you know, we don't want to be locking all of our water up into, you know, uh, uh, you know, you know, you know, you know, glaciers. We'll get another, you know, we'll get another ice age at that that standpoint. And to a degree, the same with with with, with carbon. And what biochar does is that, in some regards, it stores, it does store carbon, but it also supports the, the um, a, a lot of our life supporting. Uh, processes that 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 can help uh, in terms of biochar in the soil uh, it can it can increase fertility it can increase nutrient cycling it can increase soil structure you know the 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 the, the ability for for, for 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 roots to grow into uh, into our, our 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 soils it can it can increase water um water availability it can mm -hmm. store water in this right. you know you know you know in these 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 regards so so it is we you know you know we tend to think of 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 of, of carbon in the in the in you know you know in the soil uh as a means to release nutrients but if you're doing it all at once where's the value so 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 it's almost it has a regulating effect uh within the uh, uh within the, the 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 soil in terms of what it does from an atm for, from the atmospheric uh benefits um it does store carbon i mean in some regards it does the process does take um, um co2 out of the air and it puts us into this form that that is very stable uh and stable in the soil what's doing all these other soil soil components uh in 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 there as well and kind of can also support you know you know through that process uh it can actually become carbon negative uh through that that piece but some of the recent work um since we last since we last spoke uh is that it can can help with with a lot of the the other atmospheric uh issues that we're dealing with it can it can um support methane uh we can reduce methane emissions and we you know you know we understand that that that, that methane release um especially up in the 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 um the arctic condition right now may have potential you know may have a lot of impacts on 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 um uh you know uh, on climate change so its ability to kind of take take that out um it's been shown to really support um um, um nitrogen cycling nitrate runoff all of these other components that in that, that 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 can impact um uh, uh, uh water issues you know such as in the you know you know the great lakes region of the 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 united the the united states um and it's also being used in um uh you know large livestock um uh, facilities CAFOs, uh you know you know for example you know um uh and it's helping to to to, to absorb and reduce um um odors that are that are, that are going in there too so it really has this it just has this broad uh effect i 
I, I apologize. Um, uh, just this 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 broad effect um, on both the, the 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 soil and the atmosphere. And again, coming back to this this the, you know the importance of this thin veneer around the you know you know around our Earth's surface. Uh, it's that just that in, you know that integration. It can it, it can do so many things uh, in such a small a small volume. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and looking at this now, there's different ways of doing this, uh, different methodologies, processes. Uh, much of what you're doing is that you want to do it naturally, organically, and allow nature to heal itself, but at the same time to increase the nutrients in the soil which directly relates to air and water quality. So let's quickly go through this chart. Uh, we're gonna be running out of time uh, very quickly here, Andrew. Let's go through this and then uh, we'll hit another couple of issues and then we'll close the session out. So uh, look, look, I'll, 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 I'll summarize it very quickly. And this has been the great work that's been done in, 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 in you, know, you know, recently is that you know, you know. Originally, when we were starting to get into biochar, we were thinking that well, it's biochar. It is. It's. It's this. It's this source. It does. You know, all these great things. What we've now got is we've we've developed a a, a library uh, of material that we understand that that the different feedstock uh, and the the process for creating biochar uh, has 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 very different. Different characteristics. Um, so, for example, if we want, if if we're looking for water storage, which is something I'm very interested in working in in arid zones, um, I'm interested in finding that material and those conditions that can create a biochar that helps with water storage and water and water cycling. Um, if we're interested in nutrients uh, and nutrient cycling, um, then we, we 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 we've got a good idea. In this case, pecans are very very good at helping with 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 nutrient cycling. Uh, and you know it tends to be produced at higher at a, at 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 a higher um, a higher temperature. Uh, if we're interested in, in in carbon sequestration, we've got a very good idea what material and what process can help can help with that. Um, and you know same with water infiltration, root growth, um, and then microbial processes. Again, coming back to the ascension piece, bringing source to life. I'm very interested in looking at those um, uh, those sequences uh, that that material that can help on 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 improving. Uh, a microbial life uh, and, and, and bringing our soils to life. Yeah, this is absolutely an amazing chart, Andrew. This is something new uh, since the last time we chatted, but to have these uh, broad ways to deal with these different issues, uh, similar types of outcomes long-term, but really there's uh, different tools in the, in the toolkit uh, to get at these issues and to make sure, again, we're having that uh, soil, water and air uh, balance. Tell right. us what we have uh, right here, Andrew, and I'll have one more question and we have to get out. We're just running out of time. Yeah, yeah, sure. Look, the, the I mean, all this all this is showing is that, is, is that again, we're getting a really good understanding what material to use and how to produce it to produce different Different biochar characteristics to depend on what they, um, you know, you know, on what they're they're they're, they're working on. Um, a lot of the work that I have been doing is on mine land reclamation, and so I have metal issues. So I'm really looking at those that 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 biochar that has a high surface area that can that can that can absorb um, metals and take it out of the um, out of this out of, out of the system. So really, this is just a summary slide to, to 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 show that we're starting to get a really good handle on how best to 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 produce, for want of a better word, a designer biochar for what it is that we that we need. It's amazing what a decade will do for you. Uh, last question, you've got about 20 seconds. We have to be quick. What do you see for the growth and expansion of Ascension Soil Company over the next five, 10 or 15 years? Um, really, it, 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 it is taking these concepts and really implement them at, land, at landscape scales. And that's really where, where, where we're putting our focus. So that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, this is uh, Andrew Harley. Uh, looking at Ascension Soil Company. Thank you for being with us as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet. Looking around the globe at land, water, and air, keeping these three in balance to improve the environment, and to enhance mother nature is really what we're all about. And some of the main topics that we cover on a week to week basis on the Emerald Planet television. We have uh, Dr. Andrew Harley, who is the president 
researcher and author of Ascension Soil Company. And we're going to be talking about rejuvenation of agriculture, land using uh, biochar and biominerals to stimulate the soil to enhance growing beings, both microorganisms in the soil and everything walking around, sticking out on planet Earth. So, Andrew, welcome back to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Dr. Hancock. Appreciate it. Uh, looking at the term rejuvenation, how does that come out of Ascension Soil Company and why this very complex term rejuvenation as it relates to soil, air and water quality? I think if you the, the, the way to think through this differently is that is that presently the way we approach land use is very much from a, an, an industrial standpoint where uh, you know we, we, we have an input, we have some form of a process, and then we have an, we, we, we have an output. So we just have this linear this, this, this linear component and, and it's, it's that almost resource extraction approach to, to, to our, our economy um, our, and, so, and, and certainly our agriculture. By rejuvenation, what we're looking at doing is how can we uh, almost create this, this cyclical approach, um, that these resources become self-sustaining uh, uh, and, and reproducing so that they can continue into the uh, in, you know, in perpetuity effectively. So it's really understanding that you know looking at these processes that, that are contained within each step of that particular industrial concept uh, and working out how do we refigure those in such a way to, 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 to produce um, a better landscape. The whole thing about this, Andrew, is you're trying to uh, use rejuvenation in the sense of allowing nature to take care of itself, even though 80 percent of the population in the United States lives in uh, urban areas, a, a country like Brazil. We think of, again, wide open spaces and large nature and all that. But 87 percent of the people live in uh, urban areas. So looking at this chart, this carbon recovery surface area, how does this directly relate to a modern industrial state like the United States and many countries around the globe? And how do we take that surface area, which we think is shrinking, and actually add to and increase carbon recovery? So, yeah, I mean, one of the things that we're looking at from an agricultural standpoint is how do we feed a growing population with less and less effective land? I mean, that's that's basically the challenge that we're looking at. Um, we've talked about, you know, in terms of, of climate issues, we tend to, to think of carbon sequestration. We need to be getting carbon out of the air. How do we how do we do do, do that? So this is this concept of, of carbon recovery. And one of the processes is the manufacturing of, of, of biochar through through pyrolysis, which is, you know, you know, taking a form of carbon, um, you know, whether it be a tree or a plant or, 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 or um, uh, manure or even, you know, yeah, any form, any form of biomass uh, and, and cooking it under um, with limited oxygen. If we have too much oxygen, it's just going to burn off. If we don't have enough, then then we're not going to get that 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 that, that transformation. And there is there 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 is a window that of of both temperature and oxygen that we can use through this this pyrolysis process. So um, you know you know what we're looking at is 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 how do we kind of manufacture or design uh, this material called biochar which is the the, the result and product of, of of pyrolysis uh in such a way that can have use and 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 benefit for 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 particular different different issues whether it's um nu uh, nutrient retention and, and and cycling and availability moisture retention um for contaminant uh um uh um, sequestration uh, these these components in there as well so this chart just basically shows that we've with the, the the knowledge that we've developed uh, you know, most recently is that we understand that particular products and particular production methods can produce what we're almost ca calling a design of biochar, depending on what it is we need. Now, looking at the, this situation here, this is something you and I talked about, uh, you know, over the last decade as far as uh, rejuvenate uh, these areas, uh, particularly out in the West, where there's been heavy mining, destruction of not only the land, but also the water, particularly, and the air. So using this biochar and uh, compost, other natural materials, how can we do that effectively and move away from chemical 
fertilizers and other chemicals that in essence are starting to make the soil sterile instead of actually rejuvenating uh, the biorhythm of the soil, the air and the water. So, so coming back to your concept of rejuvenation it's, it, and that, that natural process, it's understanding what, what are the natural processes that, 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 that operate you know, you know, under an understood uh, system um, and how do we then identify and, and adjust, for want of a better word, manipulate these particular, these particular conditions. Um, in this particular case, this is, this is an old coal mine in Colorado, um, high altitude, um, you know, it's at almost 9,000 feet in this, you know, you know, in this this regards. And what we we're identifying was that there were two things that were that that that, that were limiting. There was some um, minor nutrient limitations, but more importantly, there was water limitations. That even though there was snowfall and rainfall, it wasn't being stored in the soil in order to be to be used. So in this particular case, you know, we really kind of understood what that limitation was, mm. found the biochar, found a biochar that was uh, uh, suitable for uh, water retention, which was really the rate limiting step in this particular case, uh, and then identify what were the right enough nutrients to, to, to begin that nutrient cycling piece. And again, coming back to this industrial concept where we, you know, we're used to, to putting on nutrients, growing a crop, harvesting it, taking away, taking away the nutrients. Um, what we're interested in is how do we get that cycling so that those those inputs and there are times, uh, Dr. Hancock, don't get me wrong, there are times where we still need that that um, that chemical input, but how do we use those sparingly? How do we use those to to to, to start a process, not to be reliant uh, on those on those materials? So mm -hmm. so again, that's kind of the rejuvenation concept that we're uh, that, that 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 I bring to these highly disturbed lands. Yeah, and I think that's uh, critically important. Just like the compost and uh, the biochar using natural resources. Uh, but looking at this uh, concentration map, what is this really telling us, and how does this relate moving away from this uh, postmodern industrial state of thinking about mechanics and technologies for everything, but moving back into a more natural state? So where nature is becoming in balance on its own. Yeah. So this this is some 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 work that we did on a range of of, of mine waste um, throughout the Western United United States, and this is kind of coming back to this concept of of, of developing the these designer biochars for for specific areas. So you know this is a whole you know there's there's a couple of dozen different mine waste uh, that had. Um, uh, that we're interested in, in in identifying which char could reduce. In this case, there was zinc solution from coming off this mine waste, getting into waterways, uh, and 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 creating problems. So what we're able to do the the where we actually see a zinc concentration, we show that that a particular biochar was was not effective for that particular mine waste. But you see that that there's a lot more uh, uh, cases where we were able to 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 tweak the biochar to prevent in this case zinc from from coming off this waste uh, and moving into into waterways uh, so again this is just showing you an example of where we're we're looking at different different um, uh, feedstock materials different different production uh, processes uh, to really hone in on on where we can 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 tweak the or find the right process that can start moving away from what I call geological process geochemical you know geochemical processes and start moving towards soil forming processes so this is just one of the steps that we were taking um you know several years ago to 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 figure out um uh, how best to design our chars to take it out of the laboratory uh and 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 apply it into a landscape a landscape scale you know right now we're looking at zinc in this particular chart but this could be any heavy metals uh, they could have, uh, and so this, as you're saying, this is uh, just an example. What we're looking at here uh, in this, Andrew, this looks like a very complex chart, but this is really getting back to the true essence of soil where you want to be as far as the microorganisms that are by the trillions in soil that we humans, the uh, plants and animals, we all depend on these trillions of microorganisms, correct? Yeah, this is this is kind of the next evolution of that particular particular work. The last the last slide that I was showing was zinc. I was just looking at purely from a chemical reaction. How do I get you know a a, a chemical element zinc um, to 
you know, to stay where it is and not be not be leached. And this is the next evolution of that, where bringing in understanding then how do we how do we start designing biochar to support microbial activity and microbial work. This is this particular work was done looking at 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 kind of um, um, oil impacted uh, um, uh, um, soils and how do we tweak the biochar to get those right um, uh, uh, pieces. But but there's there's part of that too is not just the, the the physical structure of it but then the chemical structure that can support microbial a, a, a activity and effectively what we're seeing here again if you you know an earlier chart i showed that we've got a range of of production temperatures what we're showing is the higher the 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 the, the temperature the more that benefits microbial activity in the in the soil uh, as we're producing it so again just kind of retweet you know you know another variation of under beginning to, to to develop that library of of knowledge or the database i suppose is a better word rather than library of knowledge of of materials and production and how does this how can we take this again out of out of the lab and look at this at a larger landscape scale I think that's absolutely fantastic. Okay, we're running out of time. So let's uh, look at this one, Andrew. What does this really mean? How does it relate to uh, humans, animals, plants, and the microbes in these three different situations? Uh, then I have one quick question and we'll be finished for this particular Thing. Yeah, so 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 the next day, but I mean, I mean, and this this is where we really are at the moment is is there's been a lot of work in the last decade, kind of at that laboratory scale, and we're now moving into that 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 landscape and and and, and human development scale. Um, you know, you know, you know, you know, and how does this, how does biochar support? Um, uh, you know, you know, you know, um, uh, um, uh, society really. Um, you know, gotta be you know, quick, Andrew. We're running out of time. So, 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 so basically, these are just the techniques that we're starting to use to really start looking at some of these carbon negative uh, processes that can be used at a soil level. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. Okay, uh, we're going to leave this uh, image up, but looking at the rejuvenation as a concept, rejuvenation as really a process, what do you see for the growth and expansion of that over the next 5, 10, or 15 years? And you have about 20 seconds. Um, I think it's really taking it to the landscape scale. We've been, the last decade has been really good at that kind of the, 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 the laboratory scale. We're now really moving in a kind of not just the pilot scale, but larger landscape scales. And that's, I think, is really exciting work here in the next decade. That's absolutely fantastic. This is Dr. Andrew Harley, president of the Ascension Soil Company, talking about rejuvenation of the soil to balance the soil, the water and air as we create the Emerald Planet. Looking around the globe, and particularly here in the United States, the whole notion of sequester and rejuvenation dealing with water, air, and soil. How do we improve these very natural ingredients that make up planet Earth, actually make up all of us living beings, whether we're animals, humans, uh, microorganisms, or plants? And so how do we use all of this the best way possible? In our history, our legacy, of course, was uh, very widespread mining all over the United States, particularly in the West, uh, for every kind of uh, mineral that was needed for the industrial state within the United States and for exports abroad. But now, how do we clean up all of this and make uh, the earth a better place in which to live and also to slow down climate change? Someone who's been doing several decades of research on this is here with us right now, Dr. Andrew Harley, who is the president, a researcher and author of the Ascension Soil Company. And we're going to be talking about rejuvenation of mine waste using both biochar and biomineral root stimulants. And Andrew, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Thank you, Dr. Hancock. Uh, looking at uh, this scene here, as far as uh, what we know from the old mine waste and where we're trying to go in the future to do this naturally and eliminate the harsh chemicals that we've been using for many decades now, particularly uh, the end of the 19th century, moving into the 20th century. What are you finding out about how do we balance nature to heal itself? 
So mine waste has its, has its own challenges. And just like there are different um, uh, minerals that come out of mines, whether it be gold or copper or iron ore or uranium or you know you know whatever it is though though the the, the waste that comes out of that material has its own characteristics uh, as as well and and up until fairly recently um, the closure and reclamation process was was you know engineering based we will just take this material that can have um, pH issues it can be you know, very low pH to, to grow things. You can have high metal concentrations. You can have no, virtually no carbon or nutrients in these, these these particular systems. So what we've done historically is we've just covered it with three feet of soil, you know, or a meter of soil. We just throw it over and um, grow, then grow on top of that and we isolate it or we dig it up and we put it into to, to some form of repository. One of the exciting things over the last uh, several decade really uh, has been how do we start moving from from those what I call geological processes or geochemical processes and start moving gently towards soil forming processes so we can go from these these barren landscapes uh, to these self sustaining uh, uh, systems that can just like any other system can begin to cycle nutrients and carbon and water uh, mm -hmm. and these these components and begin to 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 create these again self sustaining systems. Uh, using a natural design process. I want to at least stay right here, Andrew, if you don't mind looking at this image uh, because it's such a stark contrast. But looking at biochar, biominerals, and using native plants, why are native plants so important into these areas across the West? But more and more, we're finding that we have the same issues just 200 years earlier on the East Coast and sometimes even in the Midwest of the United States. So again, we're wanting to get back to that to to to, to what is what is the, the 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 system that is that is most suited to that particular area and that that, that particular location. And one of the things we 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 look at um, in in some of the disturbed sites, so, you know, the photo on the, the 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 left is we always look for what are those plants that are actually naturally kind of. Uh, uh, colonizing these disturbed areas um, and we're just looking for those 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 local components and again as we begin to shift because because all, all landscape was disturbed at, at, at some point and then there was this 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 sequence these these, these colonizing plants and then moving towards succession plants uh, and it's really if you're trying to to just plant the the succession plant in a lot of issues out west right now deal with sagebrush and sage grouse and there's been a lot of work just trying to plant that sage grouse straight oh, sorry, sorry, sagebrush um uh without going through that that soil forming processes that then lead for this material to naturally come into to to uh, to these sites got it got it now looking at uh this is a very complex image uh but just kind of uh lightly take us through this but give us the key points of what we're looking at and why this research that you've been doing for these last several decades is now really leading to this uh, bioremediation. And if you don't mind if I add this, the biorejuvenation of these sure. various soils and reclaiming these old mining sites. So one of the things we're looking at, I mean, I mean, I mean effectively we see, you know, you know, whenever I, but generally whenever I start, I'm dealing with a, with a, for want of a better word, barren or sterile, sterile, sterile environment. It has a certain chemistry uh, 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 to it. What we're trying to do is, is, is again, understand what those processes that are going on at that time within that particular system, because there are still there are still microbial processes going on, but they, they're designed for that particular chemistry, not necessarily plant growth. Um, so, so understanding that and understanding what do we need to do, uh, for want of a better word, to, to, to e e eco-engineer these these, these, these soils to understand what that process is, is by understanding what that microbial piece and that, that chemistry piece, how can we gently shift to move towards those soil forming processes? And again, we don't necessarily need to get to, to, to the final solution, but what is it that can then begin for the soils to take over and then naturally take over the, 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 their components? So again, you know, you know, we're looking at, you know, initially I start with, you know, invariably low pH, low organic matter, um, uh, you know, you know, you know, low nutrients. What amount of material do I need to do, and just enough to begin shifting where that that material goes? Oh, I can now shift and, and create this particular process. And so, look at it at at, at, at a staged approach. And sometimes it'll take several iterations until it becomes becomes self-sustaining. But what we want to do is then get to that long-term 
stability uh, within that system. Now, the problem, the, the challenge is that that may take five to 10 years as opposed to, well, we'll just come in and cover it, which is a, a, you know, you know, a short-term short -term solution. But what we're looking at doing is that any, anything that you engineer, it doesn't matter whether it's a bridge or a slope or, 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 or a cover, is most stable at the time that is built and will degrade over time. Whereas what right. we're looking at is, is creating something that is least stable at the beginning, but becomes more resilient and more st stable over, over time. So this just really shows we're just trying to get those slow mechanisms that will eventually lead to that resilience and stability. Well, the whole the whole concept of this is it didn't get broken a day. It won't be fixed in a day. And so we just have to be patient with it. But most of these are very isolated areas. They've been totally degraded. And so anything that we can do that's going to improve it naturally is, is a wonderful process. What are we looking at here as far as uh, this as a image of the natural process that we're actually looking towards and hope to be able to use far into the future? So, so, so this is really kind of a snapshot of, of, of what I'm doing at any kind of actually on the ground, um, you know, the, the, you know, you know, you know, in that, in that last, that last photo. And what we're looking at doing is I'm looking at, okay, what plants can, and there are, there are plants that can take up certain metals. So what are those plants that can take up those, those metals and begin taking them, them, them out of the, uh, the, the the system. What are those reactions that are happening in the root zone that will actually precipitate metals within the system? Um, uh, then what is those? What are those bacterial reactions? And what are the, what's the bacterial population that is doing exactly the same thing? Um, so 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 again, beginning just to understand that that process, which again takes a little bit more time. But in the long run, has has greater stability, and and I would also, um, you know, argue is actually cheaper in the long run. Um, yeah, but it's again, sure. it, but 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 again, it's just that it's that patience, it's that understanding that the the that, that we're not going to fix everything uh, um, in in you know in a short period of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, now this is something again. It's very high and complex. Uh, what does this really mean to us? Is you know, it talks about uh, biochemistry, it's, a, you know, bio everything. Uh, but how does this actually uh, work together, the biome work together in order to bring long term change and long term improvement? So, so effectively, this is just this is just that, you know, exactly that. So this is this better describes that particular process that I'm, that, 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 that I'm working with. You know, in state one, I'm dealing with this very unstable material. I've got materials that are highly reactive. Are going to be leaching, you know, you know, you know, producing acid, leaching metal. You know, you know, it's 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 a very very difficult piece. Stage two is where is where I'm really focused on uh, at the moment. What do I need to do to begin to shift from that highly reactive, deleterious material to produce this this intermediate step where I'm starting to get a degree of stability that then will begin to take over and create that third step. Whereas it is it is it is functioning uh, uh, on its own without uh, without me, and will function on its own into the future uh, without any further uh, input from you know you know you know from from human. Because as you as you pointed out earlier, a lot of these sites are um, uh, are, are remote and they're very difficult to get to. They're very difficult to get material to. Um, so, so they, you know, you know, whatever we can do to get those processes going. So it's really, this, this just shows, you know, you know, I'm working really in that state two to move from state one to state, to state three, to get from, from highly reactive to, 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 to a biogeochemically stable system. That's fantastic. Uh, this is, I really like this chart. It is complex, but I think, uh, most of our audience around the globe will actually get this, but, uh, summarize what we're looking at here. Uh, not all the chemical formulations. What is it that we're seeing, and why is it so important? So, so again, this is where we we need to understand what those microbial activity is going is 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 going on. Um, you know, a lot of the a, a lot of the the, the material that that I inherit or, or or start with have these 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 red, um, uh, green, and purple. Uh, uh, um, a material, or oh, sorry, sorry, really, really, so kind of, kind of the, the the red material. It's just they're, they're extreme 
um, bacteria that can that can just survive in very extreme conditions. What I'm wanting to do within the root zone and then with the amendments such as biochar is begin to figure out how can I create these safe environments, these localized safe environments for more uh, uh, um, a plant growth uh, microbes to survive. And this is where the root is important and this is where amendments such as biochar is, is, is moving. So again, beginning to, 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 to shift that microbial population away from those very extreme microbes that are effective in those environments to a, 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 a more plant growth related system this is where the roots are important this is where amendments are important this is where understanding uh what that what that piece is and sometimes i'm, I'm actually adding in some of that that beneficial bacteria uh to kick start those populations as we begin to 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 create systems that those extreme microbes uh, are no longer needed and also too at the same time uh, andrew it looks like everything that you're combining here you know, as far as looking at the colors and what they're doing is that you're trying to sequester water, you're trying to sequester carbon, you're trying to uh, actually remediate the soil as this whole process, no pun intended, takes root and moves forward. Uh, but you're using all the elements of nature, the land, the air and the water, because air is equally as important, oxygen right along with the, uh, the water. Uh, to make these dramatic changes, but again, at a very slow, methodical process. And, and I'm doing it in an isolated thing because a lot of these areas are large. And if you're trying to treat the whole area, that becomes very expensive. Um, so what we're like trying is, is, is targeting that process for, again, the process to take over on itself. And allow it to expand on its own. Now, we're starting to look at uh, some of these areas. Uh, we're going to go through some of these uh, images here, but just just walk us through what we're seeing and what is the process that's going on, Andrew? So, so this is just some dispersed tailings, a high altitude mine here in Colorado. We're, we're at about ten thousand feet. It's a very difficult growing season. So, you know, you know, short growing season, difficult terrain, uh, and this is just the starting material uh that that i was dealing with uh, you can see kind of the yellow patches within there that can show some of that those extreme acidophiles uh that would you know low ph a uh, high area so this is just kind of no organic matter so this is really kind of a, a very typical side of what i'm starting with mm -hmm. and this forward. is and this is this is um 12 months uh, after we did we used this particular process that's basically the same area so you can see we're getting we're getting growth uh, already uh, you know, within the first 12 months by using this process. As I was going to say, uh, when I was uh, working on my 4-H projects uh, as a youth, I was doing some of the things similar to what you have here, where you take, uh, you know, dead trees that were in the area uh, and then putting them out so it stopped the water, uh, you know, slow down the, the flow, the erosion, and just let nature take its own. And it was amazing out of the 1,200 acre ranch that we had, we were able to convert probably several hundred acres over a two decade period doing this similar kind of process. So I can attest to the, the work that you're doing. Uh, let's the next step, Andrew. And this is this was this was that this was a couple of weeks ago, exactly the same area. So you can see, you know, we're getting really, really good, good growth stability. And so we're in, you know, we're in a drought right now. This is low rainfall. This area hasn't received any any moisture for for, for over a month now. Um, and we're still just getting that good, resilient uh, system uh, that we're looking for. So that so the, that process uh, has has worked. Now, we've got a couple of spots that we may need to come back in and, 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 and redo, but we've got pretty much 95% uh, success rate uh, on this particular uh, area. This is three years later, and we haven't done anything else since that, since that initial year. Now, we were using uh, trees that, uh, you know, dead, dying, that we would actually take out and and put in these areas again to slow down the erosion, uh, the high uh, water runoff when we did have uh, severe storms. So tell us about these trees. And uh, we see the grass is going up around the trees. Uh, some of the grass even at the trees are much higher, taller than other areas. Why are these trees so important in this process that you have started here in this high mountain range? So again, so again, we're, we're really looking at natural processes, and you know, as you know, nature isn't isn't flat and and surface. So the concept we're we're, we're bringing is kind of that, that that I use in a lot of my sites is is this concept of of creating a rough and loose surface. 
Um, so to create these micro topographies, these micro climates, these micro water retention areas. And again, I'm dealing with a, in a very dry climate. So how do I better use 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 water? So the trees, in addition to um, the, 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 the the water storage piece that you talked about, it's also a natural breakdown. We know that, you know, we're in we're we're in a forested environment um, that uh the trees will will break down just as trees do so you think in a natural environment trees fall down they create these these depressions where moisture can go and, and new growth can happen but then they break down they, they they also break down and create those nutrients so it's again it's looking at that natural cycle uh, uh, which is which is suitable for this this forested in, in environment in the rocky mountains and dr andrea harley thank you very much as we look around the globe to create the emerald planet Looking around the globe and talking about this balance between the land, water, and air, it's critically important that we look at this balance in nature, look back through the centuries, the millennia, and literally millions a year of evolution on planet Earth. We're looking at this concept of ascension through the soil company that we're featuring here but also rejuvenation. And we've been talking about the rejuvenation of plants, of the land, of the water and the air. And now we want to talk about rejuvenation of communities and why that's very important. We have a true expert, it's a world leader. This is Dr. Andrew Harley. He's the president, researcher and author, Ascension Soil Company. And we are going to be talking about rejuvenation of communities. And Andrew, welcome back to the Emerald Planet TV. Great. Thanks, sir. I'm going to uh, skip over. We've uh, had your logo on before. I love it. It really talks about the essence of who and what you are as far as Ascension Soil Company. But looking at uh, the pandemics, we're talking about this one specifically, but we're, we just want to take this one, Andrew, as pandemics in general. How does it negatively impact human society, the earth, but also the environment? Yeah, look, you know, interestingly enough, the you know, you know, the essential workers are you know, you know, keeping us going right now, and there's not nothing more essential than the the the, the farm workers uh, right now. And I think we've got a real issue coming in in our food supply again. We, you know, just as we were talking about our industrial approach to uh, uh, to, to to reclamation and rejuvenation uh, and agriculture, it's, you know, you know, you know, it was, sorry, it's 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 no better define that in agriculture the importance of workers within you know you know within the you know within this and we're already the agricultural community is already dealing with with challenges of you know you know decreasing land and 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 suitable arable land and an increasing population um and then to throw on top of this right now the fact that uh we are dealing with you know we we have potential labor not just labor shortage um, but you know people's access to markets and food supplies uh, and all of, you know you know and 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 all of these things and, and the food desert is not just in going to be in urban areas I think it's going to be be, be community wise so I think we need to start looking at how our we can rejuvenate our agricultural communities in a way that 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 does have that support mm -hmm. um, and you know they they're you know people are looking at moving towards agricultural areas but what does that mean uh, in terms of of improving the uh, the food supply. You know, I've been very focused on on improving the quality and quantity of food. But if we can't get it to market, if we can't get it out of the ground, then then, then where's the value? So I think this the, the 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 current pandemic is really identifying a lot of the shortcomings that we have in our agricultural communities. So what you're uh, looking at in this chart, really, Andrew, is the fact is uh, yes, we have these challenges. We uh, may have these shortages, but at the same time, it's really it's an alarm bell that's telling us we need to wake up and start looking at nature and also the supply chain as being integral and linked together to support humanity, uh, animals, plants, uh, all living beings on the earth. So how can we uh, actually further set the alarms off is that we need to really look at this as an integrated system and we need to be doing it yesterday, not just today. Yeah, I, you know, no, no, absolutely. And I think the, you know, the, 
we're go- I, I, I predict that out of this that we'll be looking at, at, at keeping the the food supply closer to the closer to the markets mm-hmm. uh, and this is the area that I've kind of become quite 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 interested in I mean the fact that we are, are transporting food around the globe uh, to me is you know, you know I just have trouble with that whereas we know that we can be growing a, you know you know food a lot closer to to, to where it's going to be used and I just I suspect that this is where this is what's going to come out of you know you know this pandemic here in the next couple of years. Okay, that's absolutely fantastic. Uh, agricultural biodiversity, why is it so critically important? And how have we been really focused on this uh, monoculture in agriculture and focusing on a few main crops instead of going back to where we were several centuries ago, where we actually had more biodiversity closer to home, as you were saying, Andrew, instead of having to import the biodiversity from around the globe. Yeah, and and, and again, you know, you know, we, we we look at our agriculture, you know, as an industrial process, as a resource, as a mining process. You know, you know, you know, we take, you know, you know, you know, we've got a resource, we extract it, we take it off, and we process it somewhere, some so, so somewhere else. And as a result, we're seeing this decrease in arable and in 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 arable land. By by bringing in this kind of this more agricultural biodiversity, and again, some of the concepts that we've been talking about, uh, uh, you know, on other shows in relation to to to, to microbes and, and suitable amendments, has it has an impact uh, on the agricultural uh, uh, systems within it with, with within it as well. It improves fertility and water quality. It improves soil resilience. It improves plant plant resilience, um, and it improves food quality. And again, that's something that I'm very I'm, I'm, I'm very focused on and you know my academic research is, is, is around that is improving the food improving the soil to improve the the, the 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 food quality but if you also make that that more resilient then you're also making the producers more resilient uh, in there in there as well they become less uh, uh, a subject to, to to the vagrancies of of, of weathers and, you know of weather and market you know you know market driven dri- you know driven issues um, and it's this you know you know I'm really starting to to, to move out of just looking at this this resiliency in this in you know in the soil and take it out to that larger broader community resilience and societal resilience um, that that we have we've got a very efficient system we don't have a particularly resilient system and that's what 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 I I'm I'm working on shifting yeah and I've been saying that for many many years uh, people always talking about efficiency and uh, you know it's just got to be efficient this the efficient that but it needs to be effectiveness. And then it goes also back to this biodiversity. It's just like we have a diversity among populations within the United States and around the globe. We have to have this diversity as far as our agriculture is concerned, uh, the plants, the atom, animals, the, uh, the microorganisms. We need to foster this uh, diversity that we uh, have on the planet. Now, looking at this chart, this is something it really is, Uh, Very complicated when you look at them on the surface, but yet really goes to the heart of where we need to be thinking for the future as we go through the 21st century. What are we really seeing in all of this, Andrew? So there's a real move. There's 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 a movement that has been developing and interesting kind of started in some of the, 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 you know, the mining work right, you know, right now is this concept of of of. Um, uh, you know, a, a cyclical process. I described the, you know, a linear process a minute ago, where extract, transport, process, you know, move away. Uh, but where the 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 movement that I'm excited about right now is this whole concept of just, you know, you know, you know, the, a cyclical economy. Where, you know, you know, again, there are going to be times where we still do need to do some resource extraction. But then, how do we mi- minimize that? By looking at okay, what are the what is the waste of that process that can be used to function another uh, 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 another process? I mean, we're all I mean, we all understand the concept of recycle. But what about reuse? Where are, you know you know you know where can we reuse piece? Where is where where is someone's waste uh, a feedstock for another process? Uh, and this is really all this is showing. You're right; it's a bit complex, but it's basically showing starting to really think through 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 how do we minimize use of the finite resources that we that there are occasions when we need to be doing that but how do we manage that how do we manage that stock and how do we we create these flows that that not just renewable energy but renewable materials Mm -hmm. uh and you know i'm interested in that from from 
a, a, a mining standpoint, but I'm also interested in them from an agricultural standpoint as well. Because the amount of food waste, the amount of biological waste uh, that is, is in our agricultural systems is mind blowing. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, uh, where are we going here? So, so uh, again, all this is basically showing that that by by moving towards this 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 cyclical approach, where we're really kind of you know you know you know looking at at at, at understanding the circular a piece where can we be taking waste and and and, and creating other industries uh, that um basically by 2030 that the, this can the the, the the there is a huge financial advantage uh in doing this and beginning just to shift how we do how we do work and all really this is just showing is that you know look look looking at this cyclical approach uh, we can actually be be in, you know you know predicted to be three and a half billion dollars worth of uh, total business opportunities uh, just within the united states oh sorry it's well, three three and a half trillion uh in i was going to say trillion dollars and that's really uh, almost uh, a fourth of the economy right now we're about uh, 20 trillion probably less uh with the uh coronavirus uh but when you look at 87 million jobs that's with an M, 87 million jobs by 2030. That's an incredible increase as far as jobs are concerned. Yeah, and this is why I'm very excited about, you know, really, you know, you know, expanding this this particular, you know, you know, process at the community level. What are we looking at doing? Because I see that, you know, we're, you know, with we're, we're harping on the the, you know, we all know the need for good paying, good paying jobs, but do they exist in the current uh, you know, you know, our, our current economic thought, and he, and here are people who are really kind of thinking through this process, uh, and 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 allowing me to actually take some of the things that I've been working on and and tie into this particular concept. Well, the whole notion uh, that Cornell University has, as far as these small lot uh, gardens and farms, even they call them, uh, in urban areas, half an acre or less, they're yeah. saying. Most people who live in urban areas, if they would actually properly uh, develop the natural process in their own land behind their uh, their homes or their apartments or out in public lands, uh, they can make a living wage uh, through these uh, micro gardens, uh, these small lot uh, gardens. And I just think it's incredible. We have to really think differently about where we are today. Uh, the notion of work, what is work? and also productivity and how we all plug in uh, to this uh, grand economy. Uh, looking at uh, paralysis, this is going into some of the work that you've been doing your research as far as how do we really uh, look at using natural resources and a natural process. Tell us a little bit about what we're seeing here, Andrew, and why is this really so critical as we move through the 21st century, severe climate change, and more and more severe storms and and high damage and high cost to society from climate change. So, so, so again, we've talked about biochar in the past, and this is this is again just wanting to show where this fits in in this kind of cyclical economy, uh, you know, you know, you know, basis. What is our waste material? What is our you know, you know, you know, you know, manure from 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 large animal production? areas um you know uh, uh forest waste on, on forest service land which is an area that i've been working with out here in 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 colorado um uh crop residues um uh, you know um food residues you know you know yeah again how can we be taking these waste and now we've got the technology where we where we we can be tweaking it in such a way that we can producing a material in the case biochar that they can gain, then go back into the soil. So again, we're getting that process where it's coming back in the Andrew, soil. Andrew, we got 10 seconds, rejuvenation of communities. What do you see next five, 10 or 15 years? Gotta be very quick. Um, cycl the cyclical economy taking this type of concept uh, and applying it across the, uh, 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 across the agricultural world. Dr. Andrew Harley, thank you very much as we create the Emerald Planet.